This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Eat Sahone, and today we're concluding my Throne of Eldraine full set limited review. We've already looked at all the cards that are monocolored in the set. Today we're looking at multicolored cards, colorless cards, and lands. If you're new to my set reviews, in the description below you can see what all of my letter grades mean. Now let's go ahead and jump into our first multicolored card, which is Dance of the Mance, which is X, white, blue, for a rare sorcery that says, Return up to X target artifact and or non-aura enchantment cards, each with converted mana cost X or less, from your graveyard to the battlefield. If X is six or more, those permanents are 4-4 creatures in addition to their other types. So I think this needs a build around grade. If your deck just doesn't have enough artifacts or non-aura enchantments, this is just an F. Luckily, blue-white is a color pair all about artifacts and enchantments, so there's a good chance you have plenty of other reasons to play them in addition to this. One thing to keep in mind though is the fact that the rest of your artifact payoffs can count food tokens as artifacts, but Dance of the Mance doesn't because there aren't any in your graveyard. Because there aren't any food tokens in your graveyard. The non-aura thing is a very real restriction as well. And you probably also need ways to load your graveyard effectively for it to be at its best. So yeah, there are a ton of hoops to jump through on this thing, and that's why I think it's going to be an F in most decks. However, this obviously has a really high ceiling. If your deck has all of these things going on, it's probably one of the best cards you have, because not only do you get them back as useful permanents, but if you manage to pump 8 mana into it, they'll also all become 4-4s. Four How often will someone be able to pull this off? I don't know, not super often, but I do think it's doable, and I'm going to say it's a B if you really get there on artifacts and enchantments. Next up we have Doom Foretold, which for two generic, a white and a black is a rare enchantment, and it says at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a non-land, non-token permanent. If that player can't, they discard a card, they lose two life, you draw a card, you gain two life, you create a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance, then you sacrifice Doom Foretold. This is a really weird card. The sacrifice effect is symmetrical, meaning this will be most useful in a deck that can go wide. Once your opponent runs out of non-land permanence, you get some nice value, but that's going to take a while, and I think there will be plenty of board states where this is just irrelevant. Note also that if you run out of permanents that aren't Doom Foretold, you have to sacrifice the Doom Foretold, which means you're not going to be getting the extra effect, which is really what is good about this card. This seems too inconsistent to me with the caveat that maybe a go wide deck might be able to make it work. I don't know, I'm starting it at a D. Next up we have Drown in the Lock, which is the signpost uncommon for the blue black deck in this format. For blue and black, it's an uncommon instant. It says choose one, counter target spell with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard, or destroy target creature with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. So blue-black is about mill in this set, and it's been a while since we've seen such a great mill payoff in Limited, and this one is awesome, capable of countering and killing lots of things for only two mana. Your deck will need to have a fairly large focus on milling to take full advantage of this in most cases. I don't think it's good in the absence of milling, mostly because it won't be capable of doing anything until late in the game, and even then it won't be doing anything incredible. I think that means I want to steer clear of this as an early pick, but I will definitely go for it if I'm already blue-black and can load up the opponent's graveyard. I'm starting it at a C+. Next up we have Escape to the Wild, which is three generic, a red, and a green for a rare sorcery. It says exile the top five cards of your library. You may play cards exiled this way until the end of your next turn. You may play an additional land this turn. I don't think I like this a lot. Five mana is a lot, and it usually means you aren't going to be casting any of the cards you hit the turn you cast this, so you have to count on casting them on your next turn. The additional land drop does make it so you're more likely to be able to play them, but taking a turn off to not impact the board for 5 mana, and then the payoff in most cases is probably what, that you can cast 1-2 to two of the cards you revealed on your next turn? That just seems too clunky to me most of the time. If you're some sort of red-green control deck, this can maybe help you win a game when you have a ton of mana. And there is a ramp deck in this format in blue-green that could maybe splash this and maybe it's more impressive there, but for now I think it's just a D+. Next we have Fayboro Elder, which for one generic, a green and a white, is a 0-0 Treefolk Druid at rare. It has Vigilance and it gets plus one, plus one for each color among permanents you control. And you can tap it and for each color among permanents you control, add one mana of that color. This is pretty good. Without any help, this is a three mana 2-2 with Vigilance that can tap for green-white. 
that's some insane ramp, and it means that even if you're just a regular old two-color deck, it's going to be pretty good. It gets better the more colors you play, obviously enough, but the baseline here is a very good card. I think this is a B, something that you can feel confident first picking, despite the fact that it's two colors. Next up, we have Garrick Cursed Huntsman, who for four generic, a black and a green, is a legendary Planeswalker Garrick at Mythic Rare, and he's got five loyalty. That's right, Garrick is finally back. So he has a zero ability that says create two, two, two black and green wolf creature tokens with when this creature dies, put a loyalty counter on each Garrick you control. He's got a minus three that says destroy target creature, draw a card. And he has a minus six that says you get an emblem with creatures you control, get plus three, plus three, and have trample. I think Garrick is the strongest card in the entire set for limited. He's just that good. Even if all he was was a six mana sorcery that destroyed a creature and drew a card, we'd be talking about something that's a B or a B minus, but he's much more than that. He can crank out wolf tokens who protect him in two different ways. They can block and raise his loyalty, and that's pretty nice. He's just going to take over games between killing stuff and making tokens. His ultimate might not always be easy to get to since he can only raise his loyalty with the death of his wolf tokens, but it also won't be that hard because you can block with one of those wolf tokens and all of a sudden he's already at six loyalty on turn the first turn you play him. But even without this ultimate, the fact that he makes two wolf tokens at a time and can kill stuff and draw you cards is incredible. He is just a straight up A+. There's never a time you shouldn't first pick him. And if you see him even late in a draft, you should consider trying to find a way to play him, which may be a little bit of a challenge in this format because it doesn't have an overwhelming amount of fixing, but you should probably still give it a try. Next up, we have Grumgully the Generous, the red-green signpost uncommon for this set. It's one generic, a red, and a green for a 3-3 legendary goblin shaman at uncommon, and each other non-human creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. So red-green is about these non-human payoffs, and to a lesser extent, so is blue. Definitely an interesting take on a tribal archetype. And yeah, Grumgully is a nice payoff for those decks. Between just being a solid 3-mana three 3-3 three, three and making any non-human you cast after it get a plus 1 plus 1 counter, you're getting serious value. The upside is very real, but I'm not sure I want to be first picking this most of the time. Obviously, it's never going to get cut from red-green, and the upside here isn't hard to activate. I'm just not sure it's powerful enough to warrant a first pick. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, we have Improbable Alliance, which for a blue and a red is an uncommon enchantment. And it says whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 1-1 blue fairy creature token with flying. And then for four generic, a blue and a red, it says draw a card, then discard a card. This is probably the signpost uncommon I am most excited for in this set. It seems like a very powerful engine for blue-red decks. It is also nice that it can start cranking out fairies on its own if it has to once you get to six mana and can use that activated ability. And that is certainly an advantage it has over other payoffs for drawing extra cards. It can fuel itself. I think blue-red decks will have enough ways to draw extra cards that it shouldn't be too difficult to get fairies out of this a few times a game, and that's no joke. Fairy tokens can really end games. It's hard to stop a bunch of flyers. I'm close to the point where I would say first picking this is worth the risk, but I think I'm probably getting a little overexcited about this card, and I'm going to roll it back to C+, which means it is something you'll never cut in your blue-red decks, but I don't think the risk is worth spending such an early pick on. Next up, we have Inspiring Veteran, which for a red and a white is a 2-2 human knight and uncommon, and it says other knights you control get plus one plus one. Red-white is about knights. This is a knight lord. It is one of the better knight payoffs in the set, and you'll always play it in red-white, but I don't think it does enough on its own to be the kind of signpost in common that pulls you into its color pair, and that makes it a C-plus for me. Next up, we have Lockmere Serpent, who for four generic, a blue, and a black is a 7-7 rare serpent with flash. You can pay one blue and sack an island, and it can't be blocked this turn. You can pay one black and sack a swamp, and you gain one life and draw a card. And for a blue and a black, you exile the five target cards from an opponent's graveyard, and Lockmere Serpent comes back to your hand from your graveyard. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. This is also another incredibly powerful rare in this set. I think only Garrick is better than this one. This is a big creature with flash, which means it can come down and kill a creature while your opponent is attacking you, and a 7-7 body at instant speed is going to do that. It's also a 6-mana 7-7, which is just a great rate anyway. Then it can become unblockable, and that's no joke, and drawing cards in exchange for excess lands isn't either. I think what really makes this a huge bomb, though, is that it doesn't stay dead, provided your opponent gets enough cards into their graveyard. 
which if you're in blue black probably won't be that hard to make happen that means this isn't just the kind of bomb that says you better answer this or you're going to die it also says even if you do answer it it's coming back that makes this an a plus something you first pick again over every card in this set that isn't garrick Next, we have Maraleaf Pixie, which for a blue and a green is a 2-2 Fairy at Uncommon. It's got Flying, and it can tap for either green or blue mana. This is a pretty strong signpost Uncommon. It does everything it does super efficiently. A 2-mana two 2-2 two -two Flyer is good, and 2-mana two Mana Dorks that can produce two different colors are also good. It can win you games attacking in the air or by helping you ramp out fatties. I think despite this being gold, there will be plenty of times where it's just the right card to pick in pack one, pick one scenarios, if the pack's kind of weak, and that makes it a B minus. Next up, we have Oko, Thief of Crowns, who for one generic, a green, and a blue, has four loyalty. He's a legendary planeswalker Oko at Mythic Rare. His plus two creates a food token. His plus one makes an artifact or creature lose all abilities and become a green elk creature with base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. And his minus five says exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls with power three or less. I think Oko is pretty good. The turn you play him, you can get him up to six loyalty and make a food token. So while he won't always be able to immediately protect himself, getting to six loyalty does a good job of that, especially if you're actually playing him on turn three. I think most of the time, one probably alternates between the food token ability and the plus one ability, which lets you turn stuff into elks. This is particularly nice with his food tokens because he can use them to protect himself after he has some in play. His plus one has a wide range of useful abilities. It can be used to downgrade the opponent's scary creatures or upgrade yours, in addition to the fact that it can make non-creature artifacts, like food tokens, into creatures. His ultimate is kind of underwhelming, but because he also makes food, maybe sometimes exchanging food for one of your opponent's weaker creatures is going to be worth it. And sometimes there are creatures with power three or less that are actually pretty great, and stealing those will be awesome. Overall, I think Oko does enough as a three-mana planeswalker that you first pick him a decent amount of the time. I'm giving him a B. Next up, we have Outlaw's Merriment, which for one generic, a red, and two white is a mythic rare enchantment. And it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose one at random. Create a red and white creature token with those characteristics. And the three tokens you can get are a 3-1 Human Warrior with Trample and Haste, a 2-1 Human Cleric with Lifelink and Haste, or a 1-2 Human Rogue with Haste. And when this creature enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to any target. This is an incredibly powerful card. It isn't hard to get a whole card worth of value out of this. Sure, you don't get to choose which of these you get, but they're all pretty nice and all are capable of trading for an entire card of your opponents pretty easily. If you do that enough, you're just going to win the game. The one thing it doesn't have going for it is that you have to wait an entire turn before it does something since it triggers on your upkeep. But once you get a couple of triggers from this, you'll be happy. And after that, it's just going to take over the game. I think this is a bomb despite being gold. This will allow you to take over a lot of games. It's an A. Next up, we have the Royal Scions, which for one generic, a blue, and a red is a five loyalty legendary planeswalker, Will Rowan. It's a mythic rare that has a plus one that says draw a card, then discard a card. Another plus one that says target creature gets plus two plus zero and gains first strike and trample until end of turn. And a minus eight that says draw four cards. When you do, the Royal Scions deals damage to any target equal to the number of cards in your hand. So this can come down for three mana and immediately tick up to six loyalty. That's a ton for that early in the game. However, the effect the Scions have on your game isn't going to be massive most of the time. I like looting, and so does the blue-red deck that likes drawing more than one card a turn. And being able to do that every turn might be pretty great, especially because it helps you get to the ultimate, which you could conceivably use by turn six. If you get to the ultimate, you probably win the game. The card advantage and removal of that effect is incredible. This isn't the kind of Planeswalker where you desperately want it to stay in play. I mean, as soon as you use the ultimate, you're going to probably win the game, and that seems very possible. If you get them down early, it'll probably be easy. Now, the bad news about the Royal Scions is they don't protect themselves, they don't net you cards without their ultimate, and they don't kill stuff apart from their ultimate. The best Planeswalkers do one or two of those things, and they don't do any of them. This means that despite high loyalty, they could be pretty vulnerable. I think with all of that in mind, the Scions are probably worthy of a B-, though I wouldn't be too shocked to see them go down. Next up, we have Savvy Hunter, which for one generic, a black and a green, is a 3-3 human warrior to uncommon. When it attacks or blocks, you get a food token, and you can sacrifice two foods to draw a card. This seems like an awesome engine to me. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three brings solid stats, and making food, whether attacking or blocking, is nice. It means that even if you just trade with it, you're going to be getting some extra value. Then if your deck has a ton of ways to make food, and in a black green it probably will, this will just start drawing you cards, and there are absolutely going to be games where Savvy Hunter takes over late and just wins you the game. Do I think all of that warrants this being a first pick? 
I think it does. I think there's enough food in black and green, and it's good enough on its own that you can risk first picking this, even though it's a gold card, I'm giving it a B minus. Next up, we have Shine Chaser, which for one generic, a white and a blue, is a 1-1 fairy at Uncommon. It has Flying and Vigilance, and it gets plus one, plus one as long as you control an artifact, and plus one, plus one as long as you control an enchantment. So the blue-white signpost Uncommon is all about artifacts and enchantments, and it becomes a three mana, three, three with Flying and Vigilance if you control both of those. As long as you can consistently have either an artifact or enchantment in play, Shine Chaser is going to be solid, and if you can do both, you're golden. This is another signpost in common that doesn't pull me into the archetype, though. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, we have Steel Claw Lance, which is a black and a green for an uncommon artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two. It has two different equip costs. One, for equipping to a knight, only costs a single mana, and to equip to anything else, it costs three. This is a great equipment if your deck has, you know, five or more knights in it, since equip one is an amazingly cheap uh, equip cost for this bonus. Black Red is focused on knights, so I don't think we really need to give this a build around grade, since most of the time you're going to end up with enough knights to play this without even trying. It reminds me a lot of Pirate's Cutlass, which is a good comparison. I don't think you want to be taking this early, though. Take it once it's clear you're in Black Red. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, we have Stormfist Crusader, who for a black and a red is a 2-2 human knight at rare. It has Menace, and at the beginning of your upkeep, each player draws a card and loses one life. A 2-mana two 2-2 two with Menace is a great rate, and drawing extra cards is nice. The effect here is symmetrical, but I think the fact that you get a crack at the cards before your opponent does in most cases, since it triggers during your upkeep, is pretty nice. Plus, ideally, if you're playing this, you're the beatdown, and the life they lose to draw cards might help you do lethal. Still, I don't think this is awesome. It isn't like a 2-2 with Menace is going to be a great attacker forever, and you may also regret the symmetrical card draw at some point in the game. I just think of it as a solid card, which means it's a C. Next up, we have Wandermare, who for one generic, a green and a white, is a 3-3 horse at Uncommon. And whenever you cast a creature spell that has an adventure, put a plus and plus one counter on Wandermare. This is a nice build around for adventure, which is the most concentrated in green-white, and there's just a ton of it in this set. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three as a base level is already good, and if you can put even one counter on this, I think you'll be happy. Anything more than that and things will get silly. Keep in mind, too, that like most adventure build-arounds in this set, it doesn't matter whether or not the creature has gone on its adventure to trigger this. You can just cast a creature that has an adventure option, even if you never use the adventure half, and it will still get that counter. Green-White will have no problems getting cards with Adventure. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume 5 to 7 is kind of a guarantee. And for that reason, I think in some weak packs, this is worth first picking, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Wintermore Commander, who for a black and a white is a 2-star human knight at Uncommon. He has Death Touch. His toughness is equal to the number of knights you control. And when it attacks, another target knight you control gains Indestructible until end of turn. The black-white signpost in common seems pretty nice. On its own, it's a 2-mana two 2-1 two with Death Touch, which is a solid card. Add some more knights to the mix, though, and he becomes a real problem between his ever-growing toughness and the ability to make other knights indestructible. The dream is going to be to get, like, two of these into play so they can make one another indestructible. A pretty scary thing to do when they both have Death Touch. Anyway, the commander has a high floor and a reasonably high ceiling, and it doesn't look like getting the five to seven knights in your deck that this asks for will be particularly difficult. I don't think I want to first pick it at this point, but I feel like if I'm wrong about one of these signposts and commons, it's probably this guy. For now, though, I'm giving him a C+. Next, we have Arcanist's Owl, and we're moving to the 10 hybrid uncommons. There's one for each color pair, and they all cost four hybrid mana of that color pair. Something to keep in mind with all of these is that if you're not in that exact color pair or close to being monocolored in one of those colors, this is not going to be easy to cast. For example, playing Arcanist's Owl in your blue-red deck won't be very easy. So these aren't nearly as flexible as hybrid cards we've seen in the past. Anyway, back to Arcanist's Owl. It costs four Azorius hybrid mana, which means you can either pay four white or four blue or some combination thereof of blue and white. It's an artifact creature who is a bird, and it's uncommon. It's got flying, and when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an artifact or enchantment card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. A 4-mana 3-3 flyer is already a good card, and this one will draw you a card a decent chunk of the time, since blue-white decks will already be loaded up with artifacts and enchantments for other purposes. It also doesn't hurt that it's an artifact itself. I think this has enough upside that I am happy first picking it and hoping I end up in blue-white, where it's going to be a 4-mana 3-3 flyer that draws me a card a decent chunk of the time, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Covetous Urge, which costs 4 Demir 
hybrid mana. It's an uncommon sorcery, and it says, target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from that player's graveyard or hand and exile it. You may cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. This is an interesting one. I think you're going to feel the best about this when you can use it to take a card from their hand, because that will give you a two for one, but the added flexibility of being able to get things from their graveyard is also really important because it keeps us from being useless if your opponent's hand is empty like many of these effects are. Still, if you're going the graveyard route, you're not going to get nearly as much value in most cases, depending on how strong the card is that you're getting, because you're not going to be getting a two for one like you do when you steal it from their hand and then cast it yourself. This card is a little dependent on your opponent's deck and that bothers me a little bit, but I still don't think you ever cut this from a deck that casts it easily. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, we have Deathless Knight, which costs four Golgari hybrid mana. It's an uncommon skeleton knight. It's a 4-2 with haste. And whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, return Deathless Knight from your graveyard to your hand. I like this a lot. A four mana 4-2 with haste isn't anything special, but a creature like this with haste and high power is really a scary thing when it just won't stay dead. And this knight won't be doing a whole lot of that. It reminds me a lot of Oval Chase Daredevil, a 4-mana 4-2 from Kaladesh who could return from the graveyard when you played an artifact. Deathless Knight can come back anytime you gain life, something that will be pretty easy thanks to food tokens, and this is especially true in black-green, the color pair that has the most ways to make and use food to its advantage. A 4-2 is hard to kill without trading, and that's what makes it coming back over and over again so good. I think that despite the difficult mana cost here, I would be willing to first pick this in some packs, giving it a B minus. Next up, we have Elite Headhunter, which for black-red hybrid mana is a 2-3 human knight at uncommon. It's got menace, and you can pay three black-red hybrid mana and sacrifice another creature or an artifact, and it deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker. I like this. Four mana for a 2-3 isn't good, but that activated ability is very powerful. This set has a few ways of stealing the opponent's creature for a turn, which will be the sweetest thing to sacrifice to the headhunter. But even sacrificing your own guys and your food tokens to do two damage to a creature is quite strong. Now, this does have a challenging mana cost like all of these, and that does hold it back, as does the fact that it requires some setup to be at its best. But the setup isn't crazy. Your deck just needs lots of expendable creatures and food tokens and or other artifacts, and those things are going to happen. All that means that I think this is good enough to take with the first pick, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Fireborn Knight, who costs Boros Hybrid Mana. It's a 2-3 human knight at Uncommon. It's got Double Strike, and you can pay 4 Boros Hybrid Mana to give it plus 1, plus 1 until end of turn. This is some pretty serious business. It attacks really hard thanks to Double Strike, and it lets you sink mana into it sometimes so it can attack even harder. This set also has some legit equipment that also makes something with Double Strike even better. I don't imagine you ever cut this from red-white, but it's another one of these hybrid cards that doesn't really pull me into the deck either, giving it a C+. Next, we have Lock Dragon, which costs four Is It hybrid mana. It's an uncommon dragon with flying, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. This card's pretty nice. A 4-mana 3-2 flyer is always a playable card and limited, though not exciting, something like a C- minus or a C. Then you add the fact that you get to rummage when it comes into play and when it attacks, and you're looking at a card that can not only beat your opponent down in the sky, but you're looking at one that can also help you drastically improve your draws throughout the game, while also potentially triggering all the blue and red cards that give you an extra advantage anytime you can draw two cards in a turn. I think this does enough that I'm willing to at least think about first picking it in weaker packs, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Oakham Ranger, which for four Selesnia hybrid mana is a 2-2 Elf Knight at Uncommon, and you can tap it, and all your creatures get plus one, plus one until end of turn. It also has an adventure, and for four green-white hybrid mana, that adventure is called Bring Back. It's a sorcery, and it makes two 1-1 one, one white human creature tokens. Four mana for two 1-1 one, one humans isn't the most efficient thing in the world, but sometimes you need two bodies. Then the creature side of the card synergizes well with going wide, which this helps you do since it can pump your whole team by tapping. This is going to be a great card in decks really looking to go wide, but I don't think it's so powerful you end up moving into green-white just because you see this. I'm going to give it a C+. Next up, we have Rampart Smasher, who for four green-red hybrid mana is an uncommon giant and a 5-5, and it can't be blocked by knights or walls. A 4-mana 5-5 that can't be blocked by a decent number of creatures in the set is no joke. There will definitely be board states against some decks where they just can't block him. 
However, against some opponents, this will just be a 4 mana 5-5, five five, which is, of course, a good rate, but without any evasion or special abilities, it isn't anything special either. You're never cutting this from any deck that can cast it consistently, though, and that means it's a C+. Next, we have Resolute Rider, who for 4 black-white hybrid mana is a 4-2 human knighted uncommon, and you can pay 2 black-white hybrid mana and it gains lifelink until end of turn, or 3 black-white hybrid mana and it gains indestructible until end of turn. A 4 mana 4-2 four that can gain two pretty powerful keyword abilities is nice. The cost of giving it those abilities is a bit steep, but there are far worse places to spend your mana than on a 4-2 that you can make indestructible. Finding a way to block that effectively is going to be rough for your opponent, and when you can give it both, it's going to swing races in your favor. It even works defensively. In a lot of ways, it kind of reminds me of the Black Green Knight we looked at in that they both just don't die very easily, and they have high power, making it very difficult for your opponent to come out ahead. And I think, just like the Black Green Knight we looked at, the Black Green Hybrid Knight that we looked at, the White Black Hybrid Knight is also worth first picking, and I would give it a B-. Next up, we have Thunderous Snapper, who for four blue-green hybrid mana is a 4-4 Turtle Hydra at Uncommon, and when you cast a spell with converted mana, it costs five or greater, draw a card. So blue-green is the ramp deck in this format, and obviously this is pushing you in that direction as well, because drawing a card every time you play something big is great. There's no reason you will ever cut this from a deck that is either mono green, mono blue, or Simic. Outside of those, the mana cost is pretty challenging, of course, but what you get is a 4 mana 4-4 four four who draws you cards for big spells. Now, most limited decks aren't loaded up with a bunch of 5 mana or greater spells, since that would be a really bad idea for your curve. But, even if you just draw a single card off of this, you're going to be really happy since you already have a 4 mana 4-4. Four four. Still, I don't think this is good enough that you're going to want to be first picking it and seeing if Simic is open right away. Instead, it's the card you take once it looks like that's where you're going already, giving it a C+. Alright, now we're moving to artifacts. That's all the multicolored cards. Now we're moving to colorless artifacts. Obviously, there's a bunch of colored artifacts in this set too that we've already seen. But now, the colorless artifacts. First one we have is Clockwork Servant, which for three generic mana is a 2-3 artifact creature gnome and uncommon. And it has adamant, and that means when it enters the battlefield, if at least three mana of the same color was spent to cast it, draw a card. Three mana for a 2-3 is probably a D these days, but this comes with some real upside. Sometimes it will draw you a card. How often will you be able to pull off adamant with this? I think in a typical limited deck, you'll probably be able to do it like a third of the time. That's probably enough to move it up to a C in your typical limited deck. However, if you're a monocolor deck straight up, well, this becomes a pretty great uncommon, maybe one of the better ones in the format for you, as a 3-mana 2-3 that draws you a card 100% of the time is pretty close to a B-. Like with a lot of these adamant cards, I'm going to split the difference here and give it a C+. Obviously, it's going to be better than that in a monocolored or almost monocolored deck. Next up, we have Crashing Drawbridge, which for two generic mana is a 0-4 artifact creature wall at common. It's got Defender, and you can tap it so creatures you control gain haste until end of turn. The flavor here is really cool, but the card doesn't seem that good to me. A two mana 0-4 that gives stuff haste is such an odd card. Normally, a 0-4 would be good in a defensive deck, but this is pushing you to be more aggressive because of the haste thing, and it has to tap to give stuff haste so it can't really hang back and block for you at the same time. It just seems like this is a card that is in a strange place in terms of what decks would want it. Artifact synergies do exist in this set, and maybe sometimes this is something you play in those decks, but I think ideally you're not playing this, I'm giving it a D. Next up we have Enchanted Carriage, which for 5 generic mana is a 4-4 artifact vehicle, the only vehicle in the set, at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, it makes two 1-1 one -one white mouse creature tokens, and it has crew cost of 2. This seems decent to me. It gets around one of the big downsides that vehicles often have, and that's that they aren't very good on boards that don't have much going on, because it needs to be crewed to actually do anything. The fact that this makes you a couple of mice who can crew it all on their own is pretty nice. Now, you're still not getting a great deal or anything on this. It's a 5 mana spell for 2 one ones and a conditional 4-4, four four. and I think the fact that this isn't just a tiny bit cheaper holds it back from being anything more than a solid card. I'm giving it a C. Next up we have Ginger Brute, which for 1 generic mana is a 1-1 one one artifact creature food golem, at common, it has haste. You can pay one generic and it can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. And you can pay two generic and tap it to sacrifice it and gain three life. This card has a lot of silly stuff going on. You know, for one thing, it references the idea that the gingerbread man, you know, can't be caught. So only creatures with haste 
can catch him, I guess, when he activates his ability, but it's also a food. We have a few cards that we're going to see here that aren't food tokens, but count as food for all those food-related effects we've looked at. A one-mana 1-1 one, one with haste is usually not anything special, but being able to become unblockable definitely matters. It can also sacrifice to gain you life, and again, counts as food. I think all of that makes this a reasonable inclusion in your deck, especially if you either want both artifacts or food tokens, but I also think it's an easy card to cut. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, we have Golden Egg, which for two generic mana is a common artifact food. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and you can pay one generic and sack it to add one mana of any color, and you can pay two generic and tap it and sack it to gain three life. So we've seen cards a lot like this before, and they're always all right. Mana filtering that replaces itself isn't a bad thing to have around since it can help you splash, and you don't end up using a whole card for it since it draws you one. If you don't need the fixing during your game, it can also gain you life or operate as a food. Both blue-white and black-green decks will probably be the most interested in doing this because black-green likes food and blue-white likes artifacts, but I still think it's kind of a card that's on the fringe of barely making your deck. I'm going to give it a C-. Next up, we have Hengewalker, which for three generic mana is a 2-2 artifact creature golem at common, and it has adamant. In this case, if three mana of the same color is spent to cast this, it enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. This is less exciting than Clockwork Servant as the payoff for actually getting Adamant going here is the difference between a D- and a C. The floor is bad here because a 3 mana 2-2 two, two is completely horrendous and having the maximum upside of a 3 mana 3-3 three, three isn't incredible, though it is solid. I'm going to say this is a D+. Plus. In a deck that it's a 3-3 three, three all the time, you know, its ceiling is still just a C, so I'm not that impressed with it. I'm giving it a D+. Plus. Next up we have Heraldic Banner, which for 3 generic is an uncommon artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a color. Creatures you control of the chosen color get plus one plus zero, and you can tap it to add one mana of the chosen color. This is a decent mana rock. It does something most of them don't do. It affects the board right away, and there is every possibility that playing this thing makes you have attacks available that just weren't there before. How many mana rocks can do that, especially at three mana? Now, it is sort of annoying. You have to choose a color with it and stick with that forever because that means it's not going to be the most reliable way to splash. It can get it done. There just may be times when you're forced to name a non-splash color in your deck because it's going to be better. This might be a card that's actually better in a monocolor deck where all your creatures get pumped by it. Overall, I like this all right. It ramps, kind of helps you splash, and gives you a minor boost to the board state. I think that makes it a C. Next up, we have Inquisitive Puppet, which for one generic mana is a 0-2 artifact creature constructed uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you scry one, and it can exile itself to make a 1-1 white human creature token. A one mana 0-2 that lets you scry one would probably be like a D, and it really only gets to a D, I think, because of the fact that there are artifact payoffs in this set. Obviously, though, this does more than that, since it can also make you a creature token that's a human, which is, you know, a real boy, right? This format, particularly blue-white, also has a heavy emphasis on artifacts. It can provide you two chump blocks thanks to that token, which doesn't hurt. Still, I don't think you play this unless you have need of artifacts to make all your artifact payoffs good or really need low drops or something, and I think that means it's a D-plus at most. Next up, we've got Jousting Dummy, which for two generic mana is a 2-1 artifact creature Scarecrow Knight at common, and you can pay three generic to give it plus one plus zero until end of turn. So at least this has a more useful ability than Prismite, which we saw in the last set. Overall, though, I'm not impressed here. Two mana 2-1s are barely playable these days, and while it has an ability that can help it increase its power, it's still dead to literally any blocker. And sure, if you have a ton of mana, it can help you trade up, but if you're spending a bunch of mana to make a trade, you're not really coming out ahead anymore. Now, this does have two things going for it. This set has artifact payoffs and it has knight payoffs, and it's both of those. I think in those decks, playing one of these might make sense, but you're probably still hoping you get a better knight or artifact. Still, I think that does just enough for the jousting dummy to get to a D+, which is pretty good because I think it would be a D- minus or a D at the highest without those things. Next up, we have Lockthwain Gargoyle, which for one generic is a 0-3 artifact creature gargoyle at common, and you can pay four generic to give it plus two plus zero and gain flying until end of turn. A one mana 0-3 can block sort of decently in the early going, and this isn't the worst mana sink in the world in the late game when the gargoyle can start threatening the opponent in the air. And again, sort of like with the Jousting Dummy, this gets an extra boost because blue-white decks are going to like it. But I don't think you play this unless you're desperate for early artifacts for whatever reason, and I think that holds it to a D+. 
Sure, he can raise his power and gain flying, but it's a pretty steep cost and your opponent will frequently just be able to block it anyway. Next up, we have Lucky Clover, which for two generic mana is an uncommon artifact, and whenever you cast an adventure instant or sorcery spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. This looks like a really fun build around, but I think it might be a trap. You might look at it and think that you will have enough adventures to make it worth it, and I've been saying something similar about it a lot of the adventure payoffs we've looked at this week. Do you know what the difference is between those and this, though? They weren't completely useless when you don't get enough adventures. You're getting a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two, or a 3-mana two, 2 with flying that has some upside, so the fail case isn't the end of the world. Additionally, the other payoffs also trigger, regardless of whether you cast the creature from exile after it's gone on an adventure or not. With this, it demands that you use the adventures. And I think the final nail in the coffin for this for me is the fact that there are a lot of common adventures in this format that just won't be that good if you copy them. Want to rummage another time or filter another mana or counter another three mana spell? Yeah, none of those will work so well for this. For all the problems it has though, I'm not saying I think you should never play it, but I'm saying the window where you should be playing this is a heck of a lot smaller than the adventure payoffs we've seen so far. You need to have adventure cards in your deck, a lot of them, and you need to be planning on using that adventure half enough of the time to make this worth it. And that's a small window, that's a small percentage of decks that will actually make this work. So I think this really needs a build around grade because I think it will be unplayable in a lot of decks in F but it probably caps out around C plus as a build around when you get like 10 adventures that are actually worth copying. It definitely isn't the one you wanna take early and force though. Next up we have Prophet of the Peak, which for six generic mana is a five five artifact creature cat at common. And when it enters the battlefield, you scry two. This is solid. I love creatures who have reasonable stats and scry when they enter the battlefield. And this is one of those. A six mana five five isn't great, but one more mana for scry two instead of it being a six six seems worth it to me. Obviously, he is a six mana creature that isn't high impact or anything, so it isn't like you can count on him being your finisher, but a big body that smooths out your draws in the late game isn't bad. Also doesn't hurt that it's an artifact for the blue-white deck. I think he's a C. Next up, we have Roving Keep, which for seven generic mana is a five seven wall at common and artifact creature. It's got Defender, but you can pay seven mana to give it plus two plus zero and give it trample until end of turn, and it can attack this turn as though it didn't have Defender. 7 mana for a 5-7 with Defender is a horrible rate, even if you can pay 7 to give it plus 2 plus 0 and give it Trample until end of turn. That's a massive investment. You know, you have to put in 14 mana to attack with this the first time as a 7-7 with Trample. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you really need a mana sink or you really need a nice defensive creature who can turn into a win condition late, it's kind of good. But I think 99% of the time you just shouldn't be playing this. I don't quite think it's completely unplayable because it's got some stuff going on, like, you know, it's an artifact creature that matters a little bit in this set. And I think that holds it above F, but just barely. I think it's a D minus. Next up, we have Scalding Cauldron, which for one generic mana is a common artifact. And for three generic, you can tap it and sack it to deal three damage to a creature. This is the kind of colorless removal spell that you run when you're desperate for removal. I think in most sets, it would probably be a D plus. It just isn't efficient at what it does. However, as we've said numerous times, this format has plenty of artifact synergies, and I think that does enough that you'll end up playing this and feeling all right about it in your blue-white decks, where it's probably more like a C-. Next up, we have Shambling Suit, which for three generic mana is a star three artifact creature constructed uncommon, and its power is equal to the number of artifacts or enchantments you control. This is definitely a build around. On his own, he's a three mana one three, and that's horrible. He's going to be most at home in a blue white deck where there are lots of other reasons to be running artifacts and enchantments. However, he'll also be good in decks that can make some food. But I think he's an F in most decks in this format, and probably a C, maybe a C plus in a deck that can get enough artifacts and enchantments. The payoff here isn't exactly awesome, even if you get there, since his toughness stays low, making him pretty vulnerable. Next, I have Signpost Scarecrow, which for four generic mana is an artifact creature Scarecrow at common. It's got Vigilance, and you can pay two to add one mana of any color. This is a big Prismite. Prismite and its ilk are never very good and limited. They come with crappy stats and an ability that fixes, but it doesn't do a very good job of either of those things. Two mana for one mana of any color is incredibly inefficient. I think you end up playing this in situations where you desperately need fixing, even fixing this bad, or you desperately need some more artifacts or creatures or something, and I think that holds it to a D. 
Next, we have Spinning Wheel, which for three generic mana is an uncommon artifact, and you can tap it to add one mana of any color, and you can pay five generic and tap it to tap target creature. This is interesting. Having a card that helps you fix your mana and ramp that can also do something in the game once that stuff doesn't matter is pretty nice. It's no icy manipulator since five mana is a lot, but you could do worse for a mana sink, especially one that's going to give you mana of any color when you need it. But still, that's a great place to be putting mana late in the game. Tapping down your opponent's best creature every turn is really frustrating for them, and it can give you a way to win the game. I think this just barely gets into the range of being first pickable, and I think it gets that bump up from a C+, mostly because of the blue-white deck. It's already really close to a B-, but it's definitely a B- because of that, and it's one of the few sources of fixing in this set, which certainly matters, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Stone Coil Serpent, who for X mana is an artifact creature snake at rare. He's a 0-0, and he's got Reach, Trample, Protection from Multicolored, and it enters the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. This is really good. We have seen several cards like this over the years, Endless One and Ugin's Construct being the most recent, and this one blows both of those out of the water. Those others were just X mana for an XX. Ugin's Construct even came with what was mostly a downside. Here, it's all upside. And other XXs we've seen like this have all been pretty good, so this is obviously even better. Creatures like this are good because they are reasonably efficient for you everywhere on the curve, and they get to remain relevant all game long because if you top deck it late, it's going to be huge. The keyword abilities it has are all good too. Trample is the most exciting one as it means this guy can't be chump blocked forever like some big boys. Protection from multicolored will come up some in this format, though not a lot as we've already seen there aren't a ton of multicolored cards, but it will come up. And if you have to be on defense, he can even block flyers thanks to reach. I do think this falls short of being a bomb. All it has is size and a bit of evasion, but I think it is a B plus, meaning you're going to first pick it 99.9% .9 of the time anyway. Next, we have Weapon Rack, which is four generic mana for a common artifact, and it enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. You can tap it and move a plus one plus one counter from Weapon Rack onto target creature. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. This doesn't seem very good. Four mana for three plus one plus one counters that get put on your stuff super slowly, one each turn, isn't what I want to be doing with four mana. This only has a very small impact on the board right away too, just putting a counter on something, which definitely makes it even worse to spend four mana on. Also, how does a card named Weapon Rack not have anything to do with equipment? Anyway, I think I avoid playing this most of the time, I'm giving it a D. And our last artifact is Witch's Oven, which for one generic is an uncommon artifact. You can tap it and sack a creature to create a food token. If the sacrificed creature's toughness was four or greater, you create two food tokens instead. This is really flavorful. Anyway, one mana for an artifact that can turn your creatures into food seems pretty all right in decks interested in food. You can do this in response to removal, or you can block and sacrifice a creature that's going to die anyway, and this can really help you amass food, something that is pretty powerful if you have the right payoffs. Still, I don't think most decks are going to really want this, but it probably has its uses in blue-white, which likes artifacts, and black-green, which likes food, and maybe even black-red, which has a minor sacrifice theme going on. Other decks aren't going to want food so badly that this is worth playing. I'm going to give this an F in most decks and a C in a deck that can get the extra value out of it. So I know I said Witch's Oven was the last artifact, but I realized I actually missed a couple of cards and that went back and we need to talk about them. And the first of these is Sorcerer's Broom, which for two generic is a 2-1 artifact creature spirit and uncommon. And whenever you sacrifice another permanent, you can pay three. And if you do, you create a token that's a copy of Sorcerer's Broom. This was designed, I think, mostly to be a food payoff, and it is that. I'm not ultra impressed with it, but in the late game, it will be sweet to have this as a mana sink where you can spend five mana, two for the food, and three for this trigger to gain life and make a 2-1. The fact it has being a 2-1 as a fail case is fine, but the fact it's as expensive as it is keeps it from being some real exciting food payoff for most decks. Instead, it will mostly be a 2-1 that might make a copy or two of itself late, all of that means that I think this is just a reasonable payoff. I'm giving it a C. Next, we have Sorceress Spyglass, which for two generic is a rare artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you look at an opponent's hand, then choose any card name. It says activated abilities of sources with the chosen name can't be activated unless they're mana abilities. This is another card that was printed entirely to be a sideboard card and constructed that is horrible and limited. It's generally not going to be worth it, like, you know, a whole card to look at your opponent's hand, and there isn't a huge chance you'll actually name something that has a problematic activated ability. 
Most of the time you're paying two and using up a card for information, which you don't want to be doing. Then it obviously gets worse the longer the game goes on and your opponent has fewer cards in their hand. This is an F. All right, now let's move to lands. First up, I have Castle Ardenvale, which is part of a cycle of lands. They're all castles. They all come into play tapped unless you control a land of their color. They can tap for colored mana and they all have activated abilities. And I think this whole cycle is pretty nice. They're all lands that come into play tapped, sure, sometimes, but they produce colored mana and they have good activated abilities that give them additional upside. The castle will produce mana for you early, like all lands do, but then later it will take on a major role in the game, giving you something to do with four of your mana, in the case of Castle Ardenvale, every turn no matter what. These lands are all good and should be taken pretty highly. They're all pretty close to just being lands with upside. And I think some of these are even worth first picking. I think two of the cycle are, and I think Castle Ardenvale is one of them. I think it can really help you in the late game sort of grind out value by making you a 1-1 white human all the time. And I think that means it's a B minus. And yeah, that means you should take it over a lot of non-land cards and a lot of packs, even first pick it sometimes. Next up, we have Castle Embereth, a rare land. In this case, it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a mountain. You can tap it to add red, and you can pay one generic and two red, and creatures you control get plus one plus zero until end of turn. So we've got an upgraded mountain here, more or less. Something, again, that can produce mana when you need it, and then be a place to put excess mana late is pretty nice. The ability here isn't game-changing most of the time, but it makes a difference, and one of your lands is doing it, so you'll always run this in red decks, giving it a C+. Next up, we have Castle Garenbrig, which is a rare land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest. You can tap it to add green, and you can pay two generic and two green to add six green to your mana pool. Spend this of mana only to cast creature spells or activate abilities of creatures. Like all the cards in this cycle, this is like a land, a basic land almost in your deck with upside. It can help you ramp a little bit, and that's always welcome in a green deck. This might be the least impressive one in the cycle of rare lands, though, since it is a very restrictive ramp and you can only use it on creatures. It's still good, though, and you will always run these if you get them in green decks. I'm giving it a C+. Next, we have Castle Lockthwain, which is a rare land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp. You can tap it to add black to your mana pool, and you can pay one generic and two black to draw a card. Then you lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. I think this is the best of this cycle. Like all of them, it's of course a decent land to have early, but in the late game, this one has the most powerful effect. Drawing a card for three mana is awesome when it's a land doing it, and sure, you might lose life, but the ideal time to use this will be when you're in top deck mode anyway. So basically, this land is Frexian Arena. I mean, I know that's an exaggeration, but I think it's an apt comparison of how good this card is. I think you first picked this in a lot of packs. I think it's just a straight up B. Next up, we have Castle Vantress, which is a rare land. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control an island. You can tap it for blue, and for two generic and two blue, you can scry two. I like this one too, of course. Having a land that's just, you know, a regular old land early that then helps you smooth out your draws late by letting you scry every turn is pretty nice. This is another C+. Yeah, I mean, again, all of the lands in this cycle you should be taking over most mediocre cards, especially if you're clearly going to be in their color because they're really going to give you more value than you might be able to imagine. Upgrading lands is a real, real effect on your deck. So next we have Dwarven Mine, which is part of a cycle of lands that actually have basic land types, but aren't actually basic lands themselves. And they all have an effect where they come into play tapped unless you control three or more of the basic land type of their color. In the case of Dwarven Mine, that means mountains. And they all do something when they enter the battlefield untapped. In this case, for Dwarven Mine, you get a 1-1 red dwarf creature token. Getting a 1-1 out of your land may not sound like much, but think of it this way. If you're getting the 1-1 out of it, you actually paid negative 1 mana for it, kind of, since you also get a land out of the deal, and that's some nice value. Like most of the lands in this cycle, I think you should be valuing it just above mid-level filler, giving it a C. Next, we have Fabled Passage, which is a rare land. You can tap it and sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. Then, if you control four or more lands, you untap that land. So, this is a strictly better Evolving Wilds, and that's pretty nice. There aren't a lot of sources of fixing in this set. You know, they're pushing two colors and even potentially monocolored decks in this set, so there's not a lot of fixing. But you do have this at rare, and it's a pretty great piece of fixing. Like Evolving Wilds, it'll go a long way towards really helping smooth out your mana if you're trying to splash a third color. I don't quite think you want to first pick this, but maybe it's close. I'm giving it a C+. Next, we have Gingerbread Cabin, which is a land forest at common. You can tap it to add green. 
It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more forests. And when it enters the battlefield untapped, you get a food token. So this is a forest that makes a food when it comes into play untapped. And obviously, this set has a ton of ways to make use of food. Even if you don't, though, getting an artifact that gives you some life later in the game is some nice additional value to have on a forest. I think this is another card in the cycle that gets a C. Next, we have Idyllic Range, a common land plains, which means it can tap to add white, and it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other planes. And when it enters the battlefield untapped, you put a plus and plus one counter on target creature you control. Like I keep saying, uh, getting anything out of a land in addition to mana is nice, and that's true here too, since you get a plus one plus one counter. It's another C. Next, we have Mystic Sanctuary, which is an island at common. It's a land. You can tap it to add blue. And when it enters the battlefield, it comes into play tapped unless you control three or more other islands. And when it enters the battlefield untapped, you get to put an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. It's another nice card in the cycle. Now, keep in mind, putting an instant or sorcery on top is nowhere near as powerful as returning it to your hand. You're basically just improving your next draw, not really gaining card advantage. But like all of these, it's nice incidental value. I think this is another C, the kind of card you should be taking mid-pack over mediocre stuff. Next up, we have Tournament Grounds, which is an uncommon that can tap for colorless mana, or you can tap it to add red, white, or black, but you can only spend that mana to cast a knight or equipment spell. This is a land that's definitely a build around. If your deck doesn't have enough knights or equipment, it is a serious liability since it only produces colorless mana. I think once you have five to seven knights and equipment across these three colors, it is probably worth putting in your deck and it can really be used to help you splash some of the knights that are super powerful that you might want to be splashing. But the fail case here does wreck your mana and that's why I want to say it's like an F in your typical deck, but a C plus in a deck with enough knights. And the last card in this cycle, and our last card in this set, is Witch's Cottage, which is a land swamp. At common, you can tap it to add black. When it enters the battlefield, it comes into play tapped unless you control three or more other swamps. And if it comes into play untapped, you put target creature cards from your graveyard on top of your library. This is just as good as the other common non-basics with land types. In other words, it's a land with some nice upside, but nothing incredible. Getting a creature back gets better the more bombs you have. But keep in mind, it only goes to the top, so it isn't quite as good as getting the card back in your hand. This is another C. Well, now I've given my thoughts on every single card in this set. Tomorrow I'll be putting out the archetype guide, which will talk about what all the different color pairs want to be doing in this format. And I'll also be discussing how viable I think monocolored is in this format in that video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure to catch all of my future Throne of Eldraine content, including the archetype guide and draft videos, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.